The premise of this game follows two twins in a police force, your custom-made character and your sibling Akira. They're either male or female depending on which gender option you choose in the character creation menu. Once done there, the game starts. You're thrown right into the action with an intro cutscene that sets up the main mechanics of the game, Legions. And then you're thrown into a motorcycle sequence. That's a lot of shifting between scenes. Either ways, the game wastes no time in launching you into your first mission as you shoot various enemies on the way to your destination. You meet up with Akira and are faced with an invisible foe that you can't see or attack. Your father arrives and takes care of them. Within no time at all, you're reluctantly given a legion by your father. Legions are chimeras that are transformed into entities that are able to aid you in fighting other chimeras. This basically makes up most of the combat of the game. It's an interplay between your player character and the legions. The hectic and chaotic nature of the first mission isn't lost in later levels, and as hard as it is to believe, it only keeps ramping up from there. The story is full of moments with high intensity actions, which will leave you anticipating more as the game progresses. A while after the first mission, you enter the astral plane. To give some much needed context, the state of the world is uninhabitable, with chimeras to blame for the corruption that land. Humanity rests on the brink of extinction, taking refuge in a place known as the Ark. The Ark is an artificial island created to keep humanity safe from chimeras. Despite that purpose, though, Chimera still posed a threat to humanity. It's up to you and the Neuron Task Force to stop the threat of Chimeras and save humanity. Overall, the premise is a solid one, but given that it's an action game, well, it's kind of light on story. Astral Chain falls into being a serviceable enough story with rather good moments here and there, but it's nothing compelling, at least in my eyes. It's a fun ride from beginning to end, and there's many moments where the game pulls some really nice twists. Just don't expect any writing on the level of Nier Automata. To not run the risk of spoiling the story, I'm going to save most of the spoiler-heavy details for the end of the video, just in case anyone watching cares about spoilers. I know this game is like 4 years old, but I like to keep things spoiler-free given a chance. Being a platinum game, of course, it has to have really great gameplay. This is thankfully something that remains true. I mean, are you surprised it's platinum games? I mean, they kind of have a track record of having really great games. True to Platinum Games fashion, Astral Chain, just like the previous game, has a lot of different mechanics to start off basic enough, making the combat beginner friendly to newcomers, and through purchasing and obtainment of other skills and abilities, the combat begins to gain more and more depth, the kind of depth that experienced players are going to flourish in. I'm no expert in action games, but I'm not bad at them either, and as someone who loves action games, Astral Chain wins a gold medal in combat complexity. If you want to see people actually break the combat of Astral Chain, go watch some of those MAD videos, because they're kind of insane. And again, that goes for any kind of action game, but nevertheless. There's a lot to unpack with Astral Chain, from legions and to your ex-baton with three weapons. When it comes to your legion, you're not stuck to their base abilities. You start off simple while being tethered to a legion, said legion engaging in combat with you when summoned. You summon them by tapping ZL, and once summoned you can control them with the right analog stick. It can feel a little awkward at first since you're technically controlling two characters with differing analog sticks. You do have the ability to move them around enemies, and as a result you can bind them with chains. You can also launch your legion at enemies by just tapping ZL. Obviously you're going to control your avatar character, chaining together basic attacks between three weapon modes on your x -Baton. So much of this game is centered around the legion, but your character gets various moves they can learn throughout the game. Similarly to Bayonetta or Nier, you have a dodge, and if you time that dodge perfectly enough, you can actually unleash a counter attack on your enemy. You can think of the legion as a stand-in for any kind of heavy attack, unless you count the x larger form. But since most of the complexity of this game comes from the utilization of legions, there isn't much to talk about with regards to your avatar character. You have 5 total hits before your attack animation refreshes, and not too late after getting your first legion, you get the ability to sync your attacks with the legion. These sync attacks add another dimension to combat, as you have to consider which legion you're using as well as which weapon mode is active. These can affect what kind of sync attack comes out whenever you finish your normal attack animations. Using the Sword Legion with the Standard Baton gives you an extra hit on your Sync Attack with the Sword Legion. Using the Gun Mode with the Arrow Legion gives you another combo onto your Sync Attack, so on and so forth, and there's a lot more beyond this, but I've yet to see them all. I should mention the X-Baton can also be upgraded by 9 levels, meaning that you can do more damage and learn more combos throughout the game, and I wish I knew this earlier. I was kind of rushing through the game, so yeah, that's kind of on me. Anyways, let's ignore that. To top it all off, the complexity goes as far as getting a skill tree granting you the ability to gain higher stats. You can unlock skill slots and abilities that aid you within combat. 
skills tend to be passive, say 100% increase in criticals or self-destruct ability for when you put away the legion. This kind of ability can unleash a burst of energy that can hurt enemies in an area of effect, mostly things like that. There's plenty more alongside that which gives you a great advantage during combat encounters with chimeras. If I kept talking about the combat mechanics, I'd be here all day and I'm trying to make this video not too long, but going off the script length, uh, yeah, I kinda suck at doing that. Eh, not like I don't enjoy mouthing off about games, but either ways. The world of the game strays away from having the typical formula of a linear level and just pure combat. You can explore the world and investigate the situations of each area you visit. You can talk to NPCs and receive quests from them, or even use your iris to explore or even investigate the area. It also works in combat, which is pretty neat because it lets you see enemy HP values. The game feels pretty well balanced between both combat and exploration sections, letting you roam around the times, do quests, buy items, and vending machines, with each vending machine, depending on the level you're in, having their own varying personalities. There's many secrets to find across the world. The legions aren't only for combat, as well in the world of the game, you're able to pull them out at any time and utilize each ability they have. My favorite is the Beast Legion, you get to ride a big doggo. There's environmental puddle. There's environmental puzzles utilizing all five legions, each being basic yet adding on to the depth of level design. These are done with the signature ability of each legions which can be accessed by pressing the X button. I went into Astral Chain knowing nothing about each ability and look forward to each new one that you get through the game. The abilities do a lot to shake things on the gameplay and they're also usable within combat. However, they're not exactly easy to use, and sometimes you have to use the slow motion mode for it, but yeah, it's really fun to still use either ways. When I managed to strike an enemy in the sky after having comboed them with a baton, it felt satisfying as hell. For context on how fun it can be to utilize these abilities, imagine comboing an enemy and then using the arrow legion to get them while they're in the air. That kind of stuff. A lot of these abilities become relevant in the astral plane where you'll begin seeing them a lot. You eventually familiarize yourself with all of them as the game utilizes them really well and not once did I feel even the slightest bit of boredom having to do the puzzles required by the game. Each ability feels tailor-made to be fast yet streamlined enough for the player to get a hang of quickly. Boss fights are the most you'll see of these abilities in combat as some bosses, while they're not impossible to beat without legion skills, are often easier to get through with a legion's ability. Each situation calls for a different legion and you can get pretty creative with some of their uses. Granted, I beat most of the bosses without a legion's signature abilities, but the option is there and it can come in handy sometimes. Some of the late game bosses were pretty exciting given the scale they had. This is mostly a handful of bosses, but the game's bosses are great. The iris, as mentioned prior, is also really handy in combat encounters because it's the only way of seeing a boss's HP bar. Overall, every single ability within combat feels like it's well utilized and it felt like none of it was really just put there as an afterthought. That's kind of just typical platinum games, really. Every single thing feels like it was meant to be there. Now that I'm done gushing about everything the gameplay has done right, there are a handful of nitpicks I have that I should get out of the way before I forget them. For one, the camera in narrow areas can become a nuisance to control. This isn't to mention the fact that it can sometimes get stuck behind the environment itself. I was fighting one boss in the final level and a column managed to block the view of the camera. Camera issues are few and far between in this game, but when they happen, you will know. There's also times where there's so many enemies around you that the targeting system becomes a pain to adjust. It's not a bad targeting system by any means. You press the right analog stick and lock on enemies and can change targets with a flick of a stick. But there were so many times in the late game where there were large combat encounters and I honestly couldn't know how to target a specific enemy because they kept targeting the wrong one. There's also times where the reticle isn't getting off of an enemy and I'm just wondering if that's my fault or if the game is just having trouble changing targets. This makes it way too easy to get attacked by enemies from another direction. The biggest offense of this was in a set of challenge battles in the post game and I spent a good hour fighting with the camera more than the enemies themselves because it was a combination of having to fight in a narrow hallway and having to deal with a targeting system that felt like it wasn't always 100% reliable. There's also instances of enemies with projectile attacks assaulting you while you're already being hit by physical attacks. These moments aren't that common thankfully, but when they do happen, they can be kind of annoying to deal with. There's also one boss which I have to nitpick, but I'll do that in the spoiler section. I know I said that was the last nitpick, but just, just one tiny one more, please. You have to clean your legion. I have no idea what this does, but why do they have to keep moving or trying to clean the damn things? Jesus 
fucking Christ, Fido. I'm trying to get rid of the dirt on your body. Stop fighting! That's a minor nitpick, though, but it's something you do every time you finish a level. I do it just in case it affects attack stats, but I really don't know what it does. I'll put some text here in case I find out. On one final note, this is not a nitpick. Before you go into levels, there's a hub where you initiate missions from, the police HQ basically, and you can do a variety of things from customizing your characters to upgrading your baton or legatus, and buying from vending machines. You can also buy medicines from Brenda for when you're getting your ass kicked a little too much, or train in the VR training room. You can also go into the bathroom and help an invisible NPC get toilet paper. And that's about everything gameplay related. Anyways, another great thing this game has is the visuals. The art style is just the right amount of weeby action game and cyberpunk goodness and it shows. All, I mean all the surfaces are shiny as hell thanks to the cell shading. The character designs are done by Masakazu Katsura, the author of the Zetman manga which honestly I can't gauge the popularity of because I've never checked it out or anything. I saw like the opening one time and that's it. And I've had it on the back of my mind for years. Tangent aside, the character designs feel grounded within a world of the game and they don't feel out of place in this over the top style of game. I assure you, you'll remember most of the characters since they each have a design that stands out from your average NPC. The character you play as is designed by you in the character customization menu. Whatever you choose in the menu is what your twin will reflect in the game. This is great because it first cements the fact that you and Nakita are twins within the game's canon. The world itself also screams cyberpunk because of the glowing neon signs everywhere and the holographic displays that fest in each city street. Character animations feel fluid and add an impact to your attacks that feel satisfying to see unfold. From this downward slash of your sword legion's attack to the X-shaped slash when you use the baton's larger form with the axe legion. It all works in a fashion that adds style to the combat and the devastation behind your attack and the absolute satisfaction of toning your enemies. Menus feel like they belong in the world of the game because they're basically just part of the iris. The UI itself is as stylish as any other UI from this dev studio. Enemy designs are also varied for the most part as well as boss designs. Cutscenes are really well choreographed and make the game feel like an actual movie sometimes because of how damn good they look. Even boss fights are both visually stunning and challenging to take on. The only thing I can nitpick the visuals on is the frame rate and that's it because I'm not much of a stickler for resolution. With a quick search, you can find out it does exceed 720p in handheld while utilizing a dynamic resolution. Basically, for those who are as out of the loop as I am, that basically means the game changes its own resolution to boost performance. This means that Astral Chain, for the most part, is performing consistently. The few frame dips that there were are during instances of ramped up action during large scale boss fights, and maybe when there's too many enemies on screen. Otherwise, the game itself runs really well. All this intense action is backed by one of the best soundtracks I've heard from Platinum Games. I'm sorry, I love Metal Gear Rising's cheesy lyrics too, but the songs in Astral Chain top that soundtrack for me. Some of my favorite includes the opening song, which feels like a literal anime opening. It's way too upbeat for this game in all honesty. Not that it gets super ultra dark, but tonal juxtaposition between this song and the game is funny to think about. There's also the arc mall, which is great, but it feels like it's a little short-lived considering you're killing off technical monsters with barely any HP to speak of, and because of that, the song only ramps up a bit during combat encounters and then goes away. I'm going to talk about certain spoilers, so if you're spoiler sensitive, then go ahead and skip it as timestamp. I'm gonna count down, three, two, that was a complete accident. I'm gonna leave that in. The highlight for me would have to be Jenna's Salvation. The other songs are great, but this song is easily one of my favorites and the boss itself as well. All of Jenna's themes are great, but it feels like they mixed up this song with Jenna Catastrophe because this feels like more of a final encounter theme than the third phases theme. It's like, huh? The way the boss finishes is climactic as all hell. Needless to say, this solidified my love for this game's bosses. So if you're still here even after the spoiler warning, then I assume you just don't care. Anyways, I'm not going to touch on every easy little detail, but I'm going to be spoiling every single plot reveal that matters. So, 3, 2, 1, uh, there's no alarm this time. So, I mentioned the first few missions, and in one of them you're grabbed and pulled into the astral plane. Fanates come to rescue you upon your dispatchment of the Chimera. As you tread through the astral plane, you become fatigued and everyone's legatus, including yours, begins to malfunction. The legions break free and start going rogue. The only one you get back starting off is the Sword Legion and you track the others down throughout the game. Just as your chance to escape arrives, it disappears just as quickly as the legions return to attack you once more. 
Their father, Max, gets between everyone the rogue legion, sacrificing his life in an attempt to protect the twins. While it's not clear if he's entirely gone into first, it's kind of obvious given that the game doesn't subvert too many tropes, really. It's revealed shortly after a woman by the name of Jenna Anderson strikes the blows her legion production facility, meaning that more legions can't be made for police officers. Yosef, your commander, gives you the task of searching for her. At some point, Yosef is in a large and ominous room with white screens that light the whole room. He's speaking to people which seem to be ranks above him. The game isn't too subtle about how shady Yosef is, and even the way Yosef acts throughout the game gives it all away a little too easily that he isn't exactly on your side. But this does set up a nice little rivalry between Yosef and Jenna, where both have different visions of what must be done with humanity's current predicament with the state of the world. You come across her a couple times throughout the game, and she's easily the highlight of the game as she's actually an interesting villain. She's a bit tropey, and again, Astral Chain doesn't stray too far from narrative tropes, as she can go on about monologues about how the Astral Plane is really just a storage system for the materials of the world, and your basic you poor souls don't really know what's going on kind of speech, but I personally have a soft spot for that kind of trope. It is kind of cheesy, but this game isn't exactly subtle about how it delivers its exposition. If it has to use the cool villain to do it, it will do it. In the first fight with her, Akira is stabbed and she runs away as you're faced with fighting a homunculus. For a while, you have to end up doing missions without Akira, and it really didn't feel any different because it Honestly, the AI didn't contribute too much to the game's flow. It's in these parts when Akira's absence for the game starts to build the world a little more, and if there's praise to be given to the game's narrative, it has to be the world building, because it makes the world feel even more immersive. There's one level where you descend into the lower levels of the arc and come across a place where the people are impoverished to hell and back and ignored by the Union, a governmental force in the game, and left to fend for themselves contest between the upper and lower city gives the world of the game needs more life. It's not the only example of good world building in the game, but it's one of the moments that felt like it stuck out to me because it's so different from the neon colored streets of the Ark's upper city. You then meet Kyle who leads a group of people who use a drug that allows them to fight legions. This means they don't have to use a legatus to fight them. It's really nice stuff and I wish the game was as good at making a compelling story as it is with setting up a really unique world. Oh yeah, and Akira is back, I don't know where to put this, so I snuck it in here in the script, don't mind me. The final encounter with Jenna is the best part of the story, as it reveals more of her motivations, and you get really heated interactions between Yen Yenna. No! The final encounter with Jenna is the best part of the story, as it reveals more of her motivation, and you get some really heated interactions between Jenna and Yosef, and the all-too-necessary I'm the one to save mankind line. It's been a while, Yosef. Jenna, why are you doing this? Why? You know why. To put an end to this misguided project of yours. You're the one who's misguided. No! We can win! We have a future as we are! Idiot! Cling to your worthless husk, but let the rest of us evolve! Only, Only I, I can, can save, save humankind! Cut. I love the amount of cheesy over-the-top drama that comes from that line. I've already talked about her fight, but it just keeps scaling up in intensity, and after it's done, your avatar character is injured fatally and merges with their own legion. Jenna sacrifices herself, protecting your sibling from you. This form comes up again later in one of the most hype-filled parts of the game, and your ears are blessed with even more good music. The song plays anytime you take this form. For context, your sibling is killed by cloned versions of themselves that Yosef produced in the Aegis Research Institute, or ARI for short, which is basically my nickname. I swear the amount of existential dread that came up whenever I saw that acronym is unmatched by anything else. The final level is after this, and honestly the music here is fucking majestic. Best song in the game. It's so tranquil as you enter the ARI and once the reveals begin to pour in and your sibling loses their mind, the music ramps up. I love everything about this section. The story reveals, the combat encounters, and the music. All of it feels cohesive, and you can tell it was put together by a team of developers that had years of experience in game design. You end up fighting your own sibling, and it feels like a great climax for their character arc. I just wish I could say the same about the final boss. Oh god, this final boss. Basically, Yosef unleashes an object that's part of his project and gains power. Yosef is the real villain, and the game isn't really trying to hide it all that much. It's kind of put out there, he's kind of unremarkable as far as villains go, and the same goes for his boss fight. He unleashes an entity named No One, you have to fight it afterwards. Proceeding the final fight, you face off against the Noah Corps, which is 
really easy. But what comes after is the worst final boss I've played in any Platinum game. No, it's not because it's hard. It's because it's hard for all the wrong reasons. Noah Prima. It's a fitting name for a boss that's in an island called the Ark. I'm going to make some unfair comparisons to other games, but bear with me. I have played Metal Gear Rising up to the maximum difficulty. This game does not hold back on upping the difficulty at all. The fights with Jetstream Sam and all two iconic amenable Senator Armstrong are some of my favorite fights in Platinum developed games because they put your skills to the test. I have played Devil May Cry 3 and finished it just recently. I played a Switch version with style switching, but I feel that the difficulty didn't become all that much easier despite the style switching. The final boss fight was hard as hell and I still loved it. None of these boss fights felt unfair in the slightest. Noah Prime is everything a final boss fight shouldn't be. There's too many instances during the fight with Noah Prime of off-screen attacks and really bad telegraphing that happens far too fast in the final phase. There's some fair attacks in the mix, but he does so much damage that the unfair attacks ended up doing me in in one hit at times. This is on the standard difficulty, by the way. The fight with Jenna Anderson is hard, but it is fun as hell. The fight with Noah Prime was more me spamming the same ability again and again for over an hour hoping to get the better of him. Noah Prime's second form should be a criminal offense. Take everything mentioned before and dial it up by 10. Add that with the fact that if you die during that phase, you have to fight the first phase again. His attacks become faster and he starts running away more. And the best strategy for him that I found was to spam the Beast Legion. Point that I found out that you could dodge anything if you spam the Beast Legion. I didn't know until then, but I sure internalized it during this fight. I don't want to make an absolute conclusion, but I do not think this is a good boss fight at all. And I'm going to stop talking about it now because it's gonna make the game sound like it's bad, but it's a great game. I will give credit where it is due. The way you finish the fight is one of the coolest cutscenes I've seen for a final boss. Once done, Akira is holding back Noah, and he asks you to sacrifice him. You have the choice of killing him or not, but the game doesn't really care. I mean, really it's just a choice between choosing the Arrow Legion and having to do it against your own will, and choosing the Axe Legion. It's a somber end to the game either way, though. So. The ending does give a bit of hope for the state of Astral Chain's world. Fewer gates begin to open with time, according to Rivers narrating the cutscene. The story, to be fair, is alright. It has really high highs, but it's an average story, in my opinion. I never found myself too enthralled with the game's story outside of those really high highs, but the game itself is solid. It's worth the price of admission, and you owe it to yourself to buy this game and play it especially if you love action games. In total, it took me 20 hours to finish it. There's still more content afterwards and a final super boss to face off after doing like 70 short combat missions. I enjoyed my time with Astral Chain and had very few gripes of the game. I hope this video convinces you to buy it since we kinda need Astral Chain 2. Please Platinum, you kinda left us on a cliffhanger right there. It's probably happening though, given the fact that Lappy was in the Bayonetta 3 trailer. However, I still want an official announcement one day. No pressure though, I'm patient. Overall, this game has not lost touch of its predecessors. It is still a worthy addition to the catalog of games that Platinum has built over the last 10 years. Whenever a sequel for this game comes out, I'll be there to buy it. So anyone who liked this video, like it if you like it. If you hated it, then dislike it to hell and back. I don't know, I don't... I'm terrible at these kinds of outros. Yeah. Anywho, if you finished the game, let me know your thoughts because... Having a discussion over these kinds of games is fun, and I want to be able to make the kind of discussion happen in the comments. With all that said, I hope you enjoyed this video.